everybody, we are back once again on another weekend, back from life, coming to you from our individual house jails that we're in right now. Although house jail is not going to be so bad because promising you guys, nobody on Phantasma finally got my new setup and I can't get it to focus on the ring light, but that's another story. But back in, hope you're all doing the best you can despite being in home jail you know we're going to make do the best we can but we always got ideas for new content that we got coming up down the road new lists and so on so if you ever have any welcome don't boris you say something to see all the craft peasants all right all right mate all right all right listen you, you'll get your moment don't worry you'll get your moment i promise oh, i'm sorry about him but so as we're coming to you from this, if you have any ideas for new content, send us a message on Instagram, uh, slide into our DMs, or you can comment down below, send us an email, send us a message, or send a carrier pigeon, whatever you want. So, apart from that, as we get into this one, it's going to be on a little bit of a downer subject, but it's something that I think we need to talk about to hopefully get people talking, as it's going to be talking about the death of cinema. Oh uh, my god, what are we gonna do? And what I mean by the death of cinema, people, let's get ready to rant, is uh, it's just over the last little while we had a pretty much a golden age of films when you can go for when you go for things like the Star Wars franchise, the old Star Wars franchise, and we went from the to the MCU. We saw the birth of the MCU and then the death of Tony Stark, still sad. And we've seen so many cool franchises come and go. But now, what me and Ben have noticed over the last little while is, are we witnessing kind of a stagnation when it comes to across all genres, such as horror films and such? And are we at this point in films and series now where it's just going to be rehashes of old ideas from maybe books because no one has got original ideas anymore? Horror movie cliches. Where are we at? Are we all stagnated now with movies and content wise? Where do we start with this, Ben? Where? I mean, the thing is, I think the biggest issue with all of Hollywood as a whole is what you brought up, is the fact that people are trying to make franchises. Like, yeah. back when Hollywood first began in the like mid-50s, give it or take, it wasn't essential that movies had sequels. It was just a story to tell within an hour, maybe two hours at the most. Like, yeah. it was a story... You had a plot, you had a beginning, middle, and end, and if you were lucky, there was a plot twist somewhere along those three parts. Yeah, yeah. Over time, obviously, people got either stagnated by the constant just typicalness, or whether it was just they were trying to figure out a niche for themselves. And that's where I think a lot of this has gone wrong, where there have been movies that have been absolute blockbuster bombs like they've just sunk so hard into the list that it's not even knowledgeable to know they even exist well, like some of the most, movies most, are... films, most films now that get released just go straight to dvd or just fade into obscurity altogether well there is that i mean we were looking at horror movies recently and there are a few horror movies in that that are cult classics but then there are some that are so obscure so bonkers that they don't even save themselves for being so zany because they just no, they just don't have anything to them. They were just there. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I've noticed, at least in the past two, maybe three years, is that the majority of big blockbuster names have either been sequels, rehashes, or literally mimicking a concept that has already been used time and time again. Yeah. So, I mean, would, would I be able to, like, with any other listeners that uh, possibly listen to this down the road, do you mind if I just bend your ear about something just quickly? Go ahead. Well, when they, like, you mentioned, like, cliches and stuff like that. Also, another thing, a lot of films these days, from what I've noticed, even despite how good they look, are mostly cash grabs. I mean, oh, God, yes. you could take Star Wars 7, 8, and 9. Those are just cash grabs for me. Oh, they, God, yeah. For me, they do not have a place with the six films. They do not have a place. Mostly because, you know, you had George Lucas, which, if I can just give you give all you guys an example of this. So when George Lucas sold the rights to Disney, and then they wanted to basically do a cash grab for, seven, for another three films, which completely undermined the whole point of six films, which is The Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker, 
destroys the Sith, yada, yada, yada. It's not what we're getting into. And for me, those films were just nothing but cash grabs, just very mm. uninteresting, undid everything about Star Wars. And there was no point to these films being made. A lot of the actors didn't even care about being on the films. And so now I'm wondering, are we going to see films that are being made just for the sake of cash instead of content or context? Yeah, no, I think that is literally the way that movies have been going for the past two years. And we'll probably keep on going until everything's been done. I mean, let's take, for instance, the the terrible female interpretation of Ghostbusters, okay? So the whole point of it was that it was meant to balance out the scales of femininity to a degree. It was meant to be because the original Ghostbusters was heavily male-influenced, and obviously back in the 80s, it was sort of more commonplace that it was men that were the sort of, like, the heroes of the day. So at least with modern day, it made a bit more sense to bring in an all-women team. Now, the people they chose, some of them are a bit iffy to a degree. I, some of them I'm not a huge fan of, but at least they know how to write. They have decent acting chops to a degree. I'll give them credit, but, at least with the female Mythbusters, they gave it a go. <laughs> but the problem is, is the fact that it was trying too hard to replicate the original idea to the point where it was just literally ruining what had been quite decent movies originally. I mean, the fact is, I don't think the original Ghostbusters movie was intended to be such a comical thing. Like, no. originally, it was quite a dark tone. By the sequel, it made it a bit more funny because they realised that adding a bit of humour at the right points made it interesting. Their comedic timing. Exactly. Like, they knew what worked and who worked with what. But with the newer one, at the very least, it took so many different tropes and aspects from paranormal movies gone by. Like, there's a scene where I can never remember the, uh, the actress's name, but she's quite a heavy set woman. And she gets possessed by one of the ghosts. So, one of her colleagues slaps her across the face to get the ghost out of her. But before doing that, guess what she does while she's being pinned down? A very, very, very annoying trope that a lot of horror movies done, because I can't remember what movie it's inspired by, but the possessed person ends up twisting their head 360 as they're being possessed. Yeah. Which, to the point now where it's not even scary, that, that whole concept of being possessed, that your whole body contorts and you still, like, speak. Well, yeah, I mean... It's just cliché. Yeah, and I remember when, like, even now we're at this point where if a film doesn't doesn't do well, then fine, you know, just carry on. But with like, with like, I'm saying on Ghostbusters for a minute, um, like with like having an all female cast, you know, appreciate them giving it a go. You know, having more females, more female heroines is a bit more. Well, it's a lot more accepted now than it used to be, and we've had so yes. many really good female characters, especially in the MCU and such, and like oh, DC, gosh, yes. Wonder Woman, and such. So many brilliant, like. But when it comes to something like that, it's a little bit iffy because I remember, mm. I do you remember? I remember the rage, like the women were having online, like saying, "Oh, like it was an all female cast, so like no, like no men went to watch it. All men are sexists," and I was just like, "No, it's not that." Because remember. You didn't go watch it either. Yeah. It's because the film sucked. Yeah. I mean, the thing is as well, is the irony being is that they, I think they only hired Crims Herdensworth as the secretary guy. Not even as a piece of, it. As a piece of eye candy for women, which is unbelievably sexist. But then that it's one of these things that we've said time and time again when we're not streaming that... There seems to be one set of rules for one, but not for the other. And it's a very iffy line to walk. I mean, it's one of those things in Hollywood that will never make sense. Because at the end of the day, I got no bones about the idea of a man being the eye candy for a woman and vice versa. But you have to write it well, not just doing it, oh, they're sexy. Let's make them absolutely brain dead stupid. Yeah. Like, 
it's got to the point now where that again, the, this is the main rant for today, folks, is the fact that Hollywood as a whole have made so many cliches to the point where you can predict a movie just by the trailer alone. Oh, yeah, like pretty much every horror film is the same. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, it's like, let's go to horror movies for a second. So, Saw, the very first one was probably such a unique idea originally, like that nothing had been done ever since about a serial killer that was so sadistic, so twisted, but there was an element of justice to it to a degree because the whole concept was that he was trying to yeah because so, oddly it's kind of a serial killer that's putting these people in these situations but if you think about it they kind of killed themselves he didn't yes. actually do anything it, it's no. a really I, it's a no it's a really cool tweak to it so he's a serial killer but he's not really yes and the interesting plot that they did like plot twist at the end was the fact that there was actually an apprentice afterwards which Again, change the whole game of the whole trope of horror movies because there's normally just one bad guy, more and that's more it. Money. But this is it. Like we are now at the point where it's saw. Is it seven or eight now? Like there has been oh, quite a few. I, it might be. It might be bloody fourteen. I don't even know anymore. But this is the thing. Is like there has been so many incarnations, and but it boggles my mind that he. The reason why he did it all was because he was dying of cancer. But then it's like the fourth or third movie, it's then somehow debunked that he doesn't actually have cancer. It was just a way of like getting out of things. Yeah. But that's but such it, a... And then like the plot carried on and on. And then it got all convoluted and then none of it made sense in the end. And it's just like, can't, I, I hate movies that just don't know when to quit. Yes. Just like, but... especially like Star Wars. One to six stop just yes. quit if you're gonna do like maybe after film stuff like that i wouldn't personally have them in continuity i'd have maybe as an alternative story yeah like, now with star wars they're gonna do a pre prequel series now which i'm like oh, oh no i don't like yeah the idea is cool don't get me wrong but for me it's just a cash grab because now Disney are seeing how much money they're making off of Star Wars, and now you've got streaming services now, which is bringing in more revenue. So, see, the thing is, like, I love the Star Wars universe to a degree. Oh, yeah, but I, I, yeah. I said to you before, I hate prequels as a whole for any movie saga because it always makes it more complicated in the end because they're always time constrained. And this is the problem I find with a lot of movies is that they go, ah, hang on a minute. We made some decent movies, but we want to tell more of the story that we missed earlier. So we'll just crush it into these little other movies that somehow set it just before the ones we've already made. Which somehow makes no sense because we've had to squeeze it into like this tiny little space and hope that it like connects together, which it doesn't. No, well, with Star Wars, I know there's 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 fans that love them, some that hate them. Me, I'm a bit in the middle. I would have mm. changed. I would have the politics and all that crap didn't make any friggin' sense. Didn't need no. to be in it to me because it literally had no impact on the film whatsoever. No. So I saw no point in that. But now I'm seeing even with other things, you keep seeing the advertisements for Roald Dahl's witches. You know. Oh. Gosh. Oh god, that looks I'm sorry that that looks freaking rubbish. But the Ugh. point is the reason why we're like not sort of taking a shot at these at these films and series and such like that is just it's kind of I kind of got inspired by this video when me and Ben were talking about it by watching a documentary which you need to check out, which hopefully will be in the description after either Bell put it in or I was called Everything is a Remix. So it's basically your inspiration comes from someone else's idea somewhere down the line. So it's to the point where it's all inspired by a book. It's inspired by a game. You know, it's just, it feels like there's no original ideas anymore. No. no one's got any story to tell because it's all from somewhere else. But the thing I said, I've, there was an interesting, in fact, I found out a couple of years ago is that there is actually this weird little law within Walt Disney's own personal will, which is that for every Disney movie that was made after his death, 
it was to be remade every 20 years, so it would be for a new generation. Fine. But the problem is, is that we so far had a live-action version of Lion King. We've had a live-action version of Aladdin, both of which not many people enjoyed because it undid the Disney magic. Yeah, like I Disney mean, is kind of like when they do these one-shot films when you had old, when you had like the real, when you had like Lion King. Lion King will forever be one of my favourite films, but also yeah. the stories and everything, because it's like a good message for children and adults, the stories mm -hmm. are timeless. They will yeah. never get old. They will, they will always be evergreen. Yes, but the thing is as well is like I like a lot of us when we were watching the trailers for Aladdin, a lot of people said that the CGI for Will Smith as the genie just looked horrendous. Yeah. Like, not to be funny, but I would personally have just preferred the idea that they use the original scripts, because of course Disney archives everything. Yeah. They could have used the original scripts or the original audio from Robin Williams, made his genie solid CGI, and just use him. Because at least then, kids would see the same magic that I grew up with. Because I don't care what anyone says, Robin Williams will forever be the genie. He was amazing. Right. Like, I'm um, sorry, yeah, but Will Smith, nobody will ever stand up to Robin Williams. No. So Robin Williams just... Robin Williams came from a decade of comedians that is very rare to find these days. I would say the last person to degree that's similar to him is Jim, Jim Carrey. Carrey. Yeah. Yeah. Because the it's not just about telling the funny one liners and just like talking to the people you act with. He was very <laughs> he was very hyperactive. Like he very was physical, just like slapstick yes. comedian. But that was what made him more interesting as a comedian, as an actor, was that he could find such simple ways of making people laugh. I think I remember when they did the movie Good Morning Vietnam, the very first time that he did his lines, like no one really rehearsed with him because he wanted to do it like as a spitboardy type thing. And everyone was in such hysterics. They had to take like five takes because he was just so bonkers. And even in good even in Goodwill Hunting, like a lot of the scenes he scenes he did with Matt Damon were like completely improvised. Like, you know, there's that scene. Yeah, like even though this is a tad off subject, do you remember that's there's a scene in Goodwill Hunting when he's when Robin Williams' character is talking about his wife and how she used to fart in bed, and he's telling this really funny ad lib story, and that's like that's not Mac Damon acting; he's legitimately pissing himself laughing. And if you look very closely, you can see the cameraman like shaking yeah. the camera because he's laughing as well. <laughs> but this is what I find really sad about a lot of Hollywood movies for like five years now is everyone just does it for the sake of money, not for the sake of the passion. That's yeah, what I think has been... When money is the main... When money is the main kind of drive to making a film, it does show in a film. Yeah, because let's take, for instance, the original Suicide Squad movie, okay? The one that nobody bloody liked because it was just... Stupid. It, was, it was just so disjointed from the whole theme of what comic books are as a whole. But more to the point, they over-sexualized Harley Quinn just as a way to make people interested in the movie. Now that James Gunn is doing the Suicide Squad movie, and thank God, he has actually got the costume right. Everybody looks amazing. Everyone looks like they're having fun. And it looks a really interesting movie, despite the fact that we've only seen like a couple minutes worth of them actually being the characters. Yeah, well, mind you, then you had like if like going back to the first Suicide Squad, obviously to follow one from Heath Ledger's Joker, that is a freaking hard task. That yes. is a proper hard task. So, Jared Leto, I'm sorry, you don't have a chance in hell. Anybody who says that he is a good Joker, you can fight me in the comments. Seriously. And like, then when you had like Harley Quinn, which wasn't even Harley Quinn, it ruined the whole dynamic of their relationship because yes. they're not lovers whatsoever. Nope. No. And this is what annoys me is that 
years and years and years and years and years ago when it came to like movies based on certain topics or movies or whatever they'd always have either the person that wrote the original plot there as a reference guide to ensure that it all translated like Stan, like Stan Lee for Marvel was always in the background of films to make sure it's and then you right had way. and even like Steve Ditko and you also had Surrey and Fleming for the James Bond movies because of course exactly. it was his story but the problem is now is that I don't know if it's because they just don't have the time or whether they can't afford to bring them out or whether they just don't care or respect the person's story because at the end of the day that's what movies are they are live adaptations of a story yeah but the problem is is that people go oh i don't like this story i want to make it my story even though it isn't and yeah, it's like, like why I, like the, I see i see what you mean but it's just when you have even like we're going back to the documentary everything's a remix like everybody seriously you have to watch it it will blow your brain to pieces when it comes to like films music and so on like plagiarisms everywhere so uh, like you had even like even Star Wars had inspiration like from other places, but he was able to take the inspiration from like Flash Gordon and stuff like that. And George Lucas made it its own thing, its own like original idea. But now we're at a point where everything seems to have already been done. That there's nothing yeah. else to do now. There's no yeah. more original story. So like, are we witnessing the death of? creativity then now we're witnessing more the birth of just the money market you know well the thing is as well it's like one really good movie i will happily watch time and time again even though it was a bit dodgy towards the end is van helsing because it was a really unique movie to a degree about monsters about the ideology it's, it's my it like it's my guilty pleasure i actually love that film <laughs> But the problem is, towards the end of it, it just lost track. And that's where a lot of movies have gone wrong. Boris makes films, but are rated 18. Boris! I don't want to know what type of films you did involving a vodka bottle in Russia. I don't want to know. Oh dear. Shut up, you insel swine. <laughs> Fight me! <laughs> but the thing is, that's... I think that's the main reason why Hollywood as a whole is dying is because they take one bad review from, say, a minor moment in a really interesting movie and they're too scared to do anything more with it. Yeah, like, everybody, like they just get cold feet far too yeah. easy. But then, that being said, how the hell did they get away with Twilight? <laughs> oh, yeah, because, like, a little while ago, folks, before uh, the new lockdown in the UK happened, like Ben came round and we were watching that video on like the worst CGI in films, and that CGI baby, <laughs> oh, God, that was so terrible. It doesn't you, look human. You'd be better off buying a baby from Fisher Price Toys to make it more realistic than that. <laughs> Christ. Yeah, and then you get disasters like the CGI will wrinkles and origins, but. Uh, but yeah, well, like with Van Helsing, like you know, just review. It just seems that now, like we're in an age where I call it the wet wipe age because everybody gets offended by freaking everything, and everybody's yeah. so touchy now and all that they nowadays, and it annoys the hell out of me. But now, when it comes to things like you used to be able to uh, trust, um, like movie critiquing uh, websites such as Rotten Tomatoes and stuff like that, yes. but now I feel you can't even trust Rotten Tomatoes no. anymore. Because no. they, some of them, I'm not sure whether they give good reviews no matter what, just so they can have a good reputation or whatever, and they deliberately crap on... I've seen them crap on films which are brilliant. Mm. And I've seen them give fantastic reviews to films which do not deserve a, like, a place in the spotlight. So I don't feel you can even trust the critics anymore. Well, I think, to a degree, the other problem is as well, as I, I think a lot of critics are bought off because... The, I remember, I think I was watching QI, or it was something I was watching a little while ago, and there was this guy that was a critic, and he basically done a review on a movie, and they go, I really like your um, your critique. What, why did you write that? He goes, oh, just, I never saw the movie. I just sort of gave it a guess and went from there. And it's just like, this is the... 
this is what I don't trust about movie reviews because if they, unless there is a genuine, like, interesting title or description or comments about the movie, fair enough. Yeah. But when you see it when it's newspapers or certain media websites, they're yeah. bound to how, be biased. How many old DVDs have we seen that have like four stars by the sun, four stars by the Daily Mirror and stuff like yeah. that? <laughs> but this is it. It's like it kind of undoes itself because you get high expectations for a movie that doesn't deserve it because of either it being false reviews or just reviews that didn't even have much in the way to it. Yeah. But I think the thing is as well, for each decade of movies in Hollywood, there has been set themes to a degree of what movies have worked the best. Because for the past 10 years, if not maybe 15, 20 years, a lot of action movies have been quite stellar compared to everything else. Because I'd yeah. say the late part of the 90s, maybe mid-80s, is where horror movies really kicked off. Because that's like where you got a lot of special effects and so and when, on. And when you had iconic like films like Friday the 13th, Nightmare yes. on Elm Street and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. It's like even with the horror genre, like even how many Halloween and Friday the 13th films have made. Like Jason Voorhees in space. What the hell was that about? But how... Like, they're meant to be scary and iconic forever. So how much can you push it before it stops becoming scary, you know, to the point where it's not just horror, it's just whatever. But this is it. I think it's even got to the point now where like, they've had Freddy versus Jason, but I think they're going to redo that again. It, it wasn't... It wasn't bad. It was, it was okay at best. It was all But right. that's my point, is the fact that it's okay like you have such high expectations for movies that are groundbreaking you you could possibly have the original actor who played jason as i don't think the stuntman i don't think he i think he's still going to be honest mm -hmm. although robert england he's got to be in like his 70s now the guy who played freddy well i think the funny thing is he was actually in an episode of the goldbergs a couple seasons ago which was really weird in itself but the thing is, as well, it's like you got films like Terminator. How many damn movies have we had on that? Uh, like how many Alien and Predator films? Oh, how God. many crossovers have we had? Well, the thing is, as well, Alien vs. Predator has got its own like comic universe as well, which makes things even more confusing. And they, and some of them, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think some of them are still in continuity with Star Wars. Yes, there is they one have a where weird arc with Star Wars, which I'm still trying to get my head around. But then again, it kind of does make some kind of sense. But then it doesn't because of the different years and everything. Because, yeah. but then there are some movies that have been done so much to the point where you can rename it, but it's the same plot, the same bloody people, time and time again. The Fast and the Furious films. I'm sorry, I don't care if anyone's watching I, saying I that... I could not care less about that. I could not Furious. give a poop about those films, okay? I'm trying to be polite here, but I could not give a friggin' poop. It is literally, oh look, we got fast cars that do not make sense. Even my mate Mark, he is a car nut. He loves the movies, but even he says himself that they cannot break and accelerate in the same time that they give it in the movie. And also, I think you'll agree on this, the physics for the cars does not make no. subtle sense. No, of course not. But like, I, I cannot understand how the franchise is going on, even after Paul Walker's death. I'm sorry, but in my opinion, I think that is unbelievably harsh, the fact that the movie itself killed him, and they still carried on. To be honest, it's just... The stories in Fast and Furious, I'm sorry, people, but they the story sucks. All of yes. them suck. Yeah. Maybe one and two, yeah, fine. But apart from that, it's just a rehashing of the same bullcrap idea, fast yeah. cars, a main baddie, and a load of jacked up dudes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, that is it. But then, despite how much I don't really like these films i got to admit, maybe Harry Potter might be an exception to the rule of storytelling, a possible exception. 
I think the thing is with Harry Potter, though, is that it's quite an expansive universe, and yet we still have... I mean, I've not watched Fantastic Beasts because while it looked really interesting... That's, yeah, that, that was a spin-off, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it was a prequel. It was sent. It was set in the early part of the 20th century. But this is where, again, my point being with prequels doesn't work. No. Because you get time constraint. Because, God, is it Guy Ritchie or is it... Who is it that plays Dumbledore? Uh, let me I can never... I'm oh, pretty sure it's name? Guy Ritchie. Because... I think you've had three Dumbledores in the films because the yeah the original guy died. No, it was only the original actor died oh, because then it was okay. yeah because then the guy that replaced him, he's still about, but it was they got a third guy to be like the younger version of him for Fantastic Beasts. But then it's trying to figure out the aging process of wizards as well because obviously they live longer than Muggles. Because by the time you get to Harry Potter, which is like, what, early 2000, give or take? Well, the first one. Yeah. it was, The first I'm one sure. was done in 2000, 2001, somewhere around Yeah. There. So around that time, Albus Dumbledore was meant to be 115 or something. And he looks like a really old man. Something ridiculous like that. But, again, th th there's all these little finicky things like i'm trying to figure out the aging process of the wizards because then you've got other characters that don't look as old as him but he's they're older than him technically but also because it's a british film because it's like a british film as well mm. there's something which has never made sense about harry potter i every time i've sat there and watched these films i've gone i don't remember there being this many years when i was at school <laughs> yeah well the thing is, we I think the concept of Hogwarts is like it's a combination of secondary school and college. For those of you in America, it's high school and university, yeah, to a degree. Basically. But again, I got a feeling that Harry Potter, maybe in the next five years, might be rebooted. No. Uh, oh, there has been talks about a reboot, but there's also been talks for the last few years about... A, a prequel film or two, which will most likely not be just one prequel, it will be three, uh, about the story centering around the kids of the main characters, so Ron, Hermione, and Harry. So be a sequel to the originals. Yeah, I mean, so I be the kids of the Harry Potter cast, basically. Yeah, because there is a play that came out in 2018 called The Cursed Child, which is basically the oldest son of Harry. Yeah. And how it's like a legacy thing, which. I kind of like, but at the same point, it overcomplicates the story. Because the, the whole point of Harry Potter was that it was him versus Voldemort. So what else is there? Like, unless there is like another secret society of evil wizards, you're going <coughs> in a loop. Because this is the problem I have, is like, every single... I think ever since the idea of the MCU... Everybody's been trying to build their expansive universe, but they yeah. don't have much of a universe to go on. But the thing is with like the MCU and DC Comics and other comic book related media, they've had decades worth of stories they can pick and choose from. They can I mean you could have Marvel go for like the next 10, maybe 20 years, and they barely touch the surface. And DC even have only used, what, maybe 10% of the characters you oh, see. Oh, God, no, even 5%. I'd argue that. Because they're like, because they, DC has got a whole plethora of characters we've only ever seen in comics and never on film or in series. But if you yeah. think about it, because the MCU is so young, it's only what, how many years old is the MCU? Like 12 years. Yes, best part of 12 years yeah. at the MCU. So the fact been around. that they're so young, I still have hope for the MCU mm. going forward. And I think to, to the point where maybe I, when I have a child in the future, I think I'll, I'll definitely be watching it with them because it's yeah. still so young that we've seen it sort of birth from Iron Man. Although yes. you could, although you don't really count Incredible Hulk because that film wasn't no. good. But, no. No. <laughs> but the thing is. There are, like, as I was saying, like, there are certain decades that have certain tropes in terms of what works for them best. Because 
you had in the 70s, maybe late 60s for America was all sci-fi where you had Star Trek and Star Wars. For over here in the UK, we had comedy. We had all the carry-on films and God knows how many other. Oh, like, like, oh, yeah, like Dad's Army, Only Fools and Horses. But this is it. It's like every on country the buses. has... The... Oh, God, I, I love On the Buses. It's On the Buses... Carry on. I've watched two Carry On films already today. Ooh, I've seen. Room. I've seen every Only Fools and Horses episode <laughs> about a thousand times. I could probably quote every single one. <laughs> but the thing is, as well, is like there are certain shows that have tried to make it to TV. Sorry, to movie instead of TV. For one instance, is Doctor Who. In the, I think it was the late 80s, they even did a movie just for the one Doctor, the eighth Doctor, and it was all set in America. And the whole idea with that was that it was supposed to create a new series and then start it in, like, the 90s and go from there. Yeah. But due to poor ratings and bad like, translation of what it was to America, it never happened. That's why yeah. it came back a lot later than it planned. Well, yeah, just because it's a bit of a weird thing, especially in comedy, just because, like, us Brits, we understand American comedy pretty well, but Americans, like, there's nothing against them, you Americans, by the way, nothing against you, but Americans don't seem to get British humour. No. The, the thing is, is we are very subtle, we are very sarcastic, we have... We have God know, knows how much slang in the English yes. language. <laughs> But the problem is, is that while I do love a lot of American comedy, most of it is very slap in the face, and that's about it. Oh, you, I could, mean, take Eddie, you could take Eddie Murphy, Raw and Delirious, which I still love. Like back then, he could say anything, and hmm. like, but although now he'd never be able to get away with it now because he'd have lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. <laughs> hmm. But this is it. I mean, to be fair. I was surprised that they got away with doing the movie Baywatch. Like, I watched it. It was hilarious. It was, like, so over the top, some of it. Are you talking... Which one are you talking? Like, the last one with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the modern oh, one. Where they... love... I thought it was going to be crap, but I watched yeah. it, and oh, my God, I thought it was brilliant. But this is it. Like, I was surprised how they how much they got away with it, because it's pretty much taking the mick out of what the original concept of Baywatch was. But then in itself, Baywatch is unbelievably sexist and unbelievably bonkers because... <laughs> then, they, yeah. Well, it's the fact that they kept the idea of the slow-mo running. That I, <laughs> that's the most over-the-top... <laughs> but that's what I... <laughs> But that's the thing. That's what made, I think, the modern Baywatch movie funny was the fact that they were taking the mick out of what it used to be. Which is a, which is a nice twist, to be honest. I quite, I quite like that, to be honest. Oh. Um, what else? What else was there? There's something else which I was, which I was gonna, which I was gonna mention as well. These old tropes. But um, no, it's got, no, it's gone out of my head now. It'll come back to me in just a sec. Yeah, with um, if like people taking their own ideas and just making it making it their own is a lost art now. It nowadays for films and series, it's a lost art. But especially if you're going to trans, if you're going to translate sort of like a British film and make it appeal in America, that's quite difficult. But mind you, it it doesn't work the same way because American films translate very well in the mm. UK, which is funny. Which I don't really seem to understand, but but then to be fair, there have been times where here in the UK we try to mimic the concept of American films. One great movie I will happily watch time and time again is Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz, I I personally those two comedians I personally can't stand either of them. See. I think it's, it's a bit hit and miss with what they do, because originally they did a comedy series called Spaced, which was a bit iffy. But some of their stuff has been pretty interesting. Some of it's just been utter nonsense. I just love Hot Fuss because of the fact that the accents of the people in the town remind me of everyone in Devon. And 
<laughs> and it just makes me laugh that it was basically the idea of like such a quaint little town, nothing could ever possibly go wrong. And then there is just like, yeah. But the fact is that they even use a superstore that is not doesn't exist anymore called Summerfield. That's how they did some of their like supermarket shops, is they actually used the Summerfield. Yeah. But but like, but like what oh yeah, I just remember what I was gonna say. Like, you know, with like comedy shows and stuff like that, when we had some golden ones like Friends. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't really that into Friends, I didn't get it. I, it was funny, but it just wasn't for me. But then you had like old ones like Only Fools and Horses, stuff like that. The old comedy shows will forever be evergreen because you go, oh, this was what was happening at the time. But now when people bring out new comedy series nowadays, it's quite hard because every gag and every punchline's already been done. So yeah. what can you actually do now? It's like, it, well, I see comedy shows that are happening now and it's just, it's stagnant just because mm. it's kind of predictable what will happen going, I've seen that before. <laughs> well, the thing is as well is, a lot of jokes can't be done now because people get very easily offended, which makes it a lot harder for comedians. I hate people! I mean, like, there's the series Little Britain, which the early on stuff was amazing. Some of it has been very iffy as of late. Like when I was surprised even back then, in 2005, when they got away of doing blackface. Yes, but that that's my point. Unbelievably racist. <laughs> yes, but that's my point. It's stuff like that. It's, I don't know, it depends on how it's delivered because, at least with the whole concept of it in Little Britain, it was a whole character. Yeah, it's the same reason. Like then it's just, then when it, it took shots at like transgender people, which I was like, oh my God. And it just got worse and worse. But yeah. then. Some of it was legitimately quite funny, which I yeah. really did enjoy, and it was taking the piss out of stereo. It was taking the piss out of a lot of stereotypes as well, which I quite liked. So it's going, oh, people are taking the piss out of this. This is cool. But then, even it has the same, well, somewhat the same effect now with like it just seems to be after when you've had like the old uh, one, Nickelodeon. I remember when, uh, yeah, before like Selena Gomez and like. Um, Friggin' Miley Cyrus and before they were anything. And what does every kind of Disney princess, in terms of like the old series that Selena Gomez and all that used to be in, what do they usually do? They have a trend of either taking off their clothes, doing something really scandalous, or shagging. Yeah. And it seems to be like most of them have done all that. Because you see, I not, can't remember if it was Vanessa Hudgens or if it was Selena Gomez. I cannot remember for the life of me. It's one of the two. But one of them did a like they were like you know when they were doing like this all happy go lucky you know teenage girl like every that every teenage girl wanted to be and then she was in spring breakers where she was doing like coke and shagging people and like it's just okay you've gone from this and now you want to break out that image and now you've gone straight to the dark side like um okay i understand you want to break that image but jesus christ <laughs> see the thing is it's funny you bring that up because I was saying to you that here in the UK, it's very rare that any kid stars go off the rails. But in America, it is so it? it's so common, it may as well just be part of their contract as an actor. The and most I famous the, one, ha the most famous one, Miley Cyrus. <laughs> and then I say second to that is probably Macaulay Culkin. Oh, God, whatever happened. But mind you, he did have a tough like life as a kid being a child star. But that's the problem, is the fact that that's always the excuse. And I think the problem is, is that they have such high expectation as kid actors to do so much that they can't cope because they don't have the mental faculties to know what's right and wrong. They get They basically get told what to do and they just assume that that's right because at the time... They just listen to a grown-up and think that's the right thing to do. Yeah. And yet here in the UK, I think it's a law that if you're under the age of 16, you cannot do an acting performance without your parent or guardian in the same like area where you film. Because they have yeah. yeah. But in America, they literally have their agent with them at the most. And that's it. And the irony being is that it's the agents that generally shimmy them to the dark side of the acting. Yeah. But 
One other thing that I've noticed as of late with a lot of movies is that they're slowly being inspired by games, not just like video games, but other games as well. Because there was a movie that came out last year with Chris Evans and a lot of big names called Knives Out. Guess what that was inspired by? The director itself said this. It was inspired by the board game Cluedo. Like, this is the problem, is the originality is dying to the point where we are literally going, ah, let's have a look through the cupboards, what board games or what books or whatever like, I've got. What happened to just pulling an idea out of your backside? Like, what happened to that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all well and good doing that, but then there was, like, there was a modern version of The Murder on the Orient Express, a very timeless movie and a very timeless novel. But, like, why does it need to be redone? Like, there was no reason for it other than just going, we got the technology, we want to make the money, let's just do it. Yeah. I mean, I've yet to wait and see if they'll ever do a movie version of The Six Million Dollar Man. That's the last thing, I think, that from the 60s that hasn't been done. Uh, one film from the late 90s, which I've been dying to see as a live action. And because the story of this film is just absolutely gorgeous. And it always makes me cry. For some reason, it always makes me cry. I really want to see a live action of The Iron Giant. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, it would be pretty damn amazing. But it's... I don't know if the story itself wouldn't translate very well because obviously in modern well, age it's talking about like a alien robot that gains sentience for whatever reason and learns mm. emotions within about a day which I still looking at it as an adult I don't have a freaking clue how that was meant to work but no but the other thing as well is going back to the idea of aliens I wonder if E.T. would ever be remade. Oh, God, again, I, hope, I, I hope not, but I think it will. Yeah, but this is it. It's They're just the, like, because even Steven Spielberg has expressed himself. He never wants E.T. to be remade as long as he's no. alive. But that's the thing is, like, Cause unless even, like, it's... fans campaigned for years about him doing an E.T. 2, and he said, no, I will no. never do an E.T. 2. It is a gem on its own and does yeah. not need to be redone again because the message is timeless. Yes. And this is the thing is like a lot of directors these days don't have the same gumption. They just want to go, oh, I want to make my own mark or make money from this. And it always falls flat. And it always bombs, yeah. Yeah. But the other thing as well is like... <sighs> There have been other things like some TV series that have attempted to go to movies. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, we got, there was a comedy series here in the UK, I don't know if it's still going, called Mrs. Brown Boys. Oh, that yeah, was, that's still going. <laughs> but that was made into a movie as a one shot movie. And yet, I don't remember much of the way of reviews because I don't think many people spoke about it much. No, I remember going to go see it with my mum. and It was an all right film, but this, it, I just thought, no, nah, stick to the series. You're much yeah. better there. And the thing is as well, it's kind of ironic because it used to be years ago that you'd have all actors started off on TV and then they progressed to movies. But the thing is, nowadays, it's slowly switching to the point where you may get a part in the movie, but you're better off being known in a TV series. But then, yeah, now, it, now, it's the other, now it's the opposite way. It's going the other way now, movies in series. Yeah, because for, let's take, for instance, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies that were done by Michael Bay. Not going to go into it much. It was shockingly crap. End of. But... The guy that they cast as Casey Jones is Stephen Amell. Now, he's a great actor. He's actually really good at martial arts. He knows what he's doing, but it was poorly, poorly written as a character, as a plot, whatever you want to call it in the film. 
But him as the Green Arrow in the Arrowverse shows, oh my freaking god. Like, at the end of the day, I would rather see a live adaptation TV series of something than a movie because you can do the story better. Yeah, like I like so I feel like all these streaming services and everything which we have now, I wouldn't mind seeing it go all the way through to series, depending on how it's executed. Because obviously, you know, series it's hit and miss. You yes. know, it's like the ball's not always gonna land every single time, but in rare cases, some series have been hugely successful. Like, even even anybody watching this in the States or in the future, uh, there used to be a series on TV called Only Fours and Horses, which ran from, like, I think it was, like, the early 80s right the way to, like, 2003. And I think it's the longest-running comedy series in British TV, I think. Mm-hmm. And it ran for something ridiculous, like, 21 seasons, something like that. And they were all freaking hilarious. Yes. And, like, it never lost its magic, ever. And that's super rare, but when it comes to, when it comes to that with like series, there's so much. They the, there's like when you've got a two hour slot in a film, you've got to fill that two hour slot. But whereas when you have a series which maybe has about ten episodes in it, which are an hour long, you've got ten hours of story to put in, and it can carry over and carry over. So I feel that series is going to be the way to go, not films. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, they've even showcased with Disney the fact that now there's Disney Plus that they've done the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian. I've been meaning to watch it, but I just haven't had the time. But a lot of people have been interested. Then we got soon we're going to have the WandaVision series. We got Falcon and Winter Soldier. It may not be many episodes, but I think as time goes on, it makes more sense to make a TV series with the great graphics and about these characters than a two, maybe three hour movie at the most, and not get the story done. Well, this is it. If it goes in series, I'm more than happy with that result. Subscribe to Theorycraft and click bell icon so Boris can buy more vodka. <laughs> Thank you, Boris. You can't freaking have no. Look, I'm gonna go downstairs, have a cup of tea in a minute, okay? I'm fed up with your freaking interruptions. <laughs> Do the people want to hear that crap? Huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I love you, really. <laughs> Look, he does talk. <laughs> I'm so alone. Anyway, get back to the more face now. Um, when it comes, yeah, but when it comes to like movies and such, if series is the way to go, I'm fine with that. But I'm still wondering: Are we going to see the death of films now? Is there any more that could be done apart from? rehashes and cash grabs no this is it i mean i've been looking at what movies are coming out i mean there's one that looks slightly interesting called free man but that's inspired by gta it's a remix yeah but i don't think there's more to add to this today no well i want to know everybody's thoughts on this i feel it's something which we've been wanting to talk about for quite a long time i'm finally glad we finally got around to doing it yes so if you guys, it's kind of like something to break up the monotony of like the lists and so on. Uh, if you haven't checked out the uh, terrible horror movies, you know, please go check them out. I think you'll find it qu- quite funny. And especially if you skip like to around the end of the hour mark when I completely lose all my, I completely lose my core and end up crying my eyes out by the end after seeing a film called Rubber. And when I say rubber, that's not an innuendo for a condom. <laughs> no, but. This is pretty much it for this week, folks. We are slowly trying to get a bit more into doing episodes a bit more frequent. It's more about time for me and Jack because we both work different jobs and different hours. And we bam, plus we both work. If we both were not lo- working through the lockdown, we would have a lot more. <laughs> oh, God, yes. But, yeah. So, thanks for joining us, folks. It's been two dudes and a furry little guy called Boris ranting and raving as usual. And again, as usual, drop us a comment down below. Give us any ideas you think we should talk about. Or if you just like the video, just go ahead. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you all soon. Stay safe, people.